A very good morning and afternoon to everyone virtually. Welcome to today's webinar, Impact of Novel Laminar Wash on Nuclei Retention and Other Downstream Applications, a Sarah Vance story. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Curiox. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit curiox.com. Now let's get started. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well. I would now like to welcome our speakers. David Cadwallader, research scientist, Sarah Vance, and Sashi Panalagu, research scientist, Curiox. For complete biographies on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top left of your screen. David, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for that introduction. Um, Yes, so my name is David Cadwallader. Uh, I am a research scientist at Cerevance, and I'm going to talk today um, about the impact that the laminar wash technology from Curiox Biosystems has had on uh, the nuclear retention and other downstream applications for our uses at Cerevance. Um, so there's kind of four main parts to the talk today. Uh, first, I'll just give you a, a brief introduction to Cerevance as a company and our NetSeq platform. Um, I'll talk about the uh, how the NetSeq platform is underpinned by uh, nuclei isolation and preparation and how the efficiency of that preparation is uh, limited by centrifuge-based washing methods. Um, and so how we went about tackling those efficiency issues by integrating the laminar wash HT2000 system into our protocols um, and how that improved both our preparation efficiencies and also enabled us to make uh, significant financial savings. So Cerevance is a, a private pharmaceutical company uh, and we're able to highly selectively identify novel targets using our proprietary nuclear enriched transcript sort sequencing platform or NetSeq for short. Um, so we develop new therapies for neurological and psychiatric diseases that work through uh, novel mechanisms of action. And we kind of where we place ourselves is because the, the human brain is, is, is a very complex organ, it's a very complicated organ. Um, so that adds in an extra layer of difficulty in identifying differentially or selectively expressed proteins um, to, to target with, uh, with new um, therapies. Now, our NetSeq platform is, uh, as mentioned, is based on nuclei isolation and preparation. Um, and we do that using, we isolate those from human post-mortem uh, CNS tissue. And so obviously we need to have a significant amount of, of tissue and our, our uh, brain tissue collection currently um, consists of over 12,000 disease and control uh, tissue samples spanning over 50 different brain regions and with a, a wide range of, of donor ages. Um, and we've been assembling and building this and continue to, to develop and grow this collection um, through working with 21 global brain banks. So fundamentally, NetSeq allows us to uh, identify and sort cell type specific nuclei populations from this processed human post-mortem CMS, CNS tissue. Um, and these cell type specific populations enable us to make um, deep transcriptomic comparisons between our, our disease and our control tissue. And we can use these comparisons to um, expose underlying pathways that would be difficult to, to, to see in more uh, simplistic or different IPSC or animal models. So that's kind of a lot of words for NetSeq, and this is a bit more of a, a pictorial overview of the processes involved. Um, so as mentioned, we start with our, our 
post-mortem CNS tissue. So these are a snap frozen samples and we're able to take small, um, small tissue dissections that are, are region specific. And from those, we can homogenize the tissue and from the homogenate, we're able to isolate and fix the nuclei before labeling them, usually with antibodies, uh, occasionally with riboprobes. Um, and then we're able to identify and sort those cell type specific nuclei populations um, at the cytometer using fluorescent activated uh, nuclei sorting or, or fluorescent activated cell sorting, as it's shown in the, in the image above. Um, from those populations, we can then extract and sequence the RNA to generate our cell type specific transcriptome, which can then be used for, for downstream analyses. So what I'm gonna focus on today is the work that, that our group run. Um, and that's really this middle part of uh, the platform. So going from the small uh, tissue dissections through to homogenizing it, uh, fixing the nuclei, labeling the nuclei and, and sorting the nuclei into their um, cell type specific populations. And within the work that our group do, I'm really gonna highlight where the HT2000 has made a, a big difference to our work. And that's in this middle section here. Um, so focusing on the antibody labeling side of things. So typically we uh, label our nuclei with indirect antibody labeling. So we would um, we'd incubate our sample with a um, target primary antibody that is does not have any, any uh, fluorochromes attached. And then we would have a, a second incubation with our species specific secondary antibodies that contain our, our uh, desired fluorochromes because that gives us a bit more flexibility when designing our panels. So before the HT2000 came along, uh, we would do centrifuge wash based um, cycles. So we would have our 60 minute incubation with our primary antibodies. Um, and then after that, in order to make sure we remove any unbound antibody to give us the cleanest signal at the cytometer, we would run three rounds of three minute uh, spins in the centrifuge, which is, you know, there's nine minutes of spin time, but then there's all the other time in between. Uh, so you've got to unload the, the centrifuge, remove the supernatant, resuspend the pellet, reload it into the centrifuge, and so on, and do that three times. And then we've got our secondary incubation, so another half an hour before repeating the, the wash cycle. So as you can see from sort of my, my estimated summing there, that's quite a significant amount of time. And that kind of feeds into some of our, where we're limited by the use of uh, the centrifuge within this uh, platform. So it is, it is a lot of time, as it was on the previous slide there, it's you know two to two and a half hours of, of work in the afternoon. Um, and that, that scales. So if you're only handling say three or four samples, it's quite quick to take them out of the centrifuge, remove the supernatant across those four tubes, resuspend those four pellets, reload it into the centrifuge. But if you're handling more, say we're doing 15, 16 samples, it's going to take a lot longer because you know it's it's fiddly up putting them into the centrifuge, let alone the time taken to handle all of those and remove all of the supernatant, resuspend all the pellets. So it can take a, quite a long time if you're looking to handle a higher number of samples. We've also got a limit in terms of how much we can handle per sample. So the, the maximum and minimum amount of nuclei, which is, is manageable uh, within our within the tube. So we use just standard 1.5 mil Eppendorf's. Um, and we've found, again, over a long period of uh, optimization that we can sort of get away with a maximum of 10, maybe if you push it, 15 million nuclei per tube. Um, any more beyond that, and the pellet just becomes quite uh, the top of the the top of the pellet doesn't uh, pack down as tightly, and it, it can get sort of quite fluffy. So as you pipette off the supernatant, you run the risk of losing some of those nuclei as um, as the the pipette tip gets too close. And it's kind of the same at the at the other end of the scale. So with the the minimum amount, um, the pellet is so much smaller; it's very fragile and it, it doesn't pack down at the bottom of the tube. Instead, it kind of smears along the, the outside of the tube, which again makes it very difficult to 
accurately and carefully remove the supernatant without disturbing the pellet and risking loss. So we found that if we want to have, if we're only looking at this tube to have enough to record and we're not looking to sort, so say it's for a, uh, a compensation control or a, um, an unlabeled control, we can get away with um, less, about half a million, 500,000 nuclei of a tube, because we're not as concerned about making sure we maximize the amount of nuclei in the sample at the cytometer. However, if we want to make sure we've got enough to sort from, and it's, you know, it's dependent on the populations we're sorting, but we don't want to go below about a million nuclei in the tube to start with. Because again, you just, the smaller it gets, the more difficult it is to keep that whole pellet intact and not lose anything. So this is where the, uh, the HT2000 came in. So on the time front, it makes a big difference. So as opposed to nine minutes of time of the centrifuge running plus time in between to um, remove the supernatants and resuspend the pellets, you simply take your, your 96 well laminar wash plate, load it onto the instrument, hit start, and in under five minutes, it's washed the entire plate and the wells are ready for you to spike the secondary antibody in for the next incubation or if it's at the end to um, to resuspend the nuclei and filter them through to go to the cytometer. So it's, it's a significant time saving on that front. It's gone from 15 to 30 minutes for a wash cycle to, to five minutes. Um, and in the same way, it doesn't, that wash time doesn't scale with the number of samples. So it's a, the laminar wash plate is a, on a 96 well plate format. So it takes the exact same number, amount of time for uh, you to wash 25 samples on the plate as it would do if you wanted to wash 75 samples on the plate. It's that same sub five minute wash time for an equivalent um, wash cycle to our three by three minutes in the centrifuge. We've also tested in terms of the limit of the nuclei uh, per tube or per sample. And we've found that at the top end of the scale, we've tested as high as 8 million nuclei per well without seeing any observed uh, reduction in uh, nuclei at the cytometer. Um, so it's a little lower, but it's, you know, the, the difference between eight and 10 at this scale is, is fairly small. Um, but at the other end of the scale, with where we're talking about the minimum limits, that's where we've made a big, big gain. Um, so if we're looking for control, we can go as, as low as 100,000 nuclei um, in there and have an equivalent amount of nuclei to record for our sample at the cytometer as we would do with 500,000 nuclei in our centrifuge based protocol. And if we want enough for the, to sort from the sample, again, we don't make as big a relative saving, but again, we can go from 1 million required in our centrifuge to half a million nuclei in the laminar wash plate and have a, an equivalent amount of nuclei to sort at the, uh, at the end of the process. So again, for those of you who are a bit more like me and a bit more visually minded to, to put that in perspective, there is a slight decrease with the laminar wash at the top end. Um, but at the, at the lower end, if we're wanting to sort, we can, we can put much less in. We can, we can put in half the amount and get out the same amount at the end of the process. And for the, um, for the control, again, even we can put in 20% of what we would previously needed to put in and have a viable and equivalent sample at the cytometer. So that gives us a lot of flexibility when we're, we're working with post-mortem human tissue. So we never know how many nuclei we're gonna get out of a particular piece of tissue until we've uh, homogenized the tissue and isolated the, the nuclei, fixed them, and had an opportunity to, to count uh, a representative sample of it. So, you know, this gives us a lot more flexibility with what we're able to do. And just as importantly as all of that, in fact, I'd, I'd say more importantly than any of that is the laminar wash technology is very gentle with our nuclei. Um, so we've seen no apparent change in the RNA integrity or the resultant RNA sequence um, data quality that we get out uh, at the end of the platform, at the end of our NetSeq platform, 
and so crucially we've been able to to introduce this technology to our protocols without having an impact on our our the the quality of data that we are able to produce using this so again to put it in perspective with the centrifuge two to two and a half hours whereas with the laminar wash it's a hundred minutes you know it's a little over an hour and a half which is a you know that's saving 20 minutes 50 minutes if we're going even if we're handling lots and lots of samples it could even save us an hour or more which is very important as i'm sure i'm sure all of you like me have a lot of issues with finding time to do you know everyone's favorite work of, of returning to their desk and continuing on with their data analysis that they're, they're hiding away from in the lab um so kind of to sum up so far we've made significant time savings with the introduction of the HG2000. It's given us a greater amount of flexibility by reducing the nuclei, nuclei input that we need to have the same output. And it's managed to do all this while maintaining the same standard of high quality data that we're able to generate. So the next question is, can we, can we, make, can we save some money with it too? So our centrifuge based protocol, um, means uh, requires that we label our nuclei with the antibodies in a 500 microliter reaction volume and our antibody panels we've optimized over quite a long period of time the ones we have in use currently and we typically describe the um, antibody concentration that we use as a, as a fraction so 90 or 95 percent of all our antibodies we would add as either one in 250 where we'd add two microliters in a 500 microliter reaction volume or one in 125 where we'd add four microliters however because of the size of the wells on the laminar wash plates that we use with the ht2000 system um, we've had to scale that reaction volume down to 50 microliters which means obviously we had to to go back and re-optimize the antibody concentrations for our established panels to um, make sure that we were able to continue and have the same quality of signal at the cytometer so i'm just going to talk you through some of the early optimization work that we did when we first um, started testing this on the hg2000 and in red, we've got our centrifuge wash sample. So this is our control. This is labeled in exactly the same way that we always would do and we always had done before. Um, so we've got antibody B on the x-axis here. And typically we would add antibody B, we'd add four microliters. Um, so that would be at a, a dilution of one in one, two, five. Um, in blue, we have our first condition that we tested on the laminar wash plate where we maintain the same um, dilution factor so we added the antibody again at one in one two five so in this case we added 0.4 microliters into our 50 microliter well and you can see it's kind of we're still seeing the same population um but the separation is not as clear whereas at the other end of the scale we also tested reducing the dilution factor and maintaining the same absolute volume of antibody added now in green here, option B is actually, we've slightly reduced the um, absolute volume of the antibody added. So we halved it from four microliters to two microliters. So at a dilution factor of one in 25, um, because this was, the, this was the, the best quality signal that we saw. So again, this uh, negative population that's circled in the uh, top left of the, the population, actually across all three conditions, the uh, the percentage of this population is incredibly similar. It's 5.3 at its lowest and 5.45% at its highest. So it's not a huge difference, but crucially what is different is the level of separation that we're seeing from the main positive population to the right of it. And it's, it's, a, it's a clearer separation in option B than we saw in option A. So this was kind of the first round of testing that we did. And we took that information and we, uh, conducted further rounds of optimization across multiple antibody panels. So we've got another example here where this time we've got antibody C uh, on the x-axis. Again, in red is our centrifuge wash control, where this time we would add two microliters. 
um, into our 500 microliter reaction volume for a dilution factor of one in 250. And again, in blue, we have option A, where we've reduced the antibody volume from two microliters to 0.5 microliters. And in green, we focus more on reducing the dilution factor. Again, as before, this green one, actually, we've reduced the absolute volume again by 50%, and this produced the cleanest separation. So again, these percentages of these populations are actually very similar. So this large positive population is sitting around about 40% um, for both the red and the blue, it's a little higher than the green, in fact, at 45%. Um, but it's fairly consistent. What is different is the, the separation of that positive population from the negative population. In the blue, it's less, there's, a, there's not as strong a signal, and what separation there is, is slightly messier. It's not got a clean break. It shows up a bit more clearly on the contour plots, but it's still, it's not quite as good as we could get, and it's not quite as good indeed as we did get with our option B where we reduced uh, the absolute volume by 50%. And that was the tail that we saw across all our uh, primary antibody optimization was that reducing the absolute volume of antibody added from our centrifuge uh, wash panel to our laminar wash panel produced the most consistent and the, the, the strongest signal overall. However, as I said, 90 odd percent of our um, antibody labeling is indirect antibody labeling. So we had to repeat these titration experiments with our secondary antibodies. And once again, we've got on the left hand side, we've got our red um, plot is our centrifuge wash control plot. And we saw, as with the primary antibodies, that a 50% uh, addition, a 50% reduction, sorry, of our secondary antibodies produced the best result overall, so that the cleanest separation and the strongest signal. So that's meant that we were able to stand, we were able to say, okay, we'll take our, our centrifuge wash based antibody panels that we've optimized for, for this protocol, and we can reduce the volume of antibody that we add for use with our laminar wash protocol by 50%. So we've halved the amount of antibody used. And that's meant that we can make a, a significant savings in the the uh, our spending on antibodies. So just from those antibodies that we've discussed so far that I've shown on those slides so far, where we've got three different primary antibodies and the uh, corresponding secondary antibodies, I've just shown you uh, an approximate spending that we would uh, make on those per year in pound sterling um, based on our current usage and then the second row, we're showing how much we'd save by halving our use for the, our use of them by labeling the nuclei instead in the laminar wash plates. And across just those three primary antibodies and those three secondary antibodies, we'd save over three and a half thousand pounds. So from that, that's you know that's a lot, that's a significant amount of money from three three antibodies and three secondary antibodies. You know. Uh, extrapolate that across other panels that we've run and I'm sure the same for you if you if you have a similar thing that that adds up to to a, a significant amount of money across the course of a year and as we all know antibodies are expensive most things in, in science are expensive so the more you can find ways to, to save this money without importantly without compromising um, your results the better and what we've seen is that labeling our antibody, uh, labeling our nuclei, sorry, on laminar wash plates across time has shown consistency. So this consistency, as well, it's important to note, is true regardless of the operator. So unlike with a centrifuge wash based protocol, where each individual user will maybe take a little bit more or a little bit less of the supernatant out and risk losing a little bit more nuclei. Um, unlike that, whoever the user is, they just pick up the plate, they put it in the instrument, they press start, and the instrument does it the same every single time. So this consistency is true all the way through. And I've just taken a couple of examples here of uh, nuclei that were labeled with the same antibodies um, and were the nuclei were isolated and prepped 
from matching tissue dissections. What I mean by that is they were, uh, both these pieces of tissue were dissected from the same donor and from the same um, brain slice across the same brain region, uh, but they were done seven months apart. So you can see there is, you know, there's a slight difference in how they show up, but that's because I've checked back, these are actually recorded on two different instruments. Um, so you will see a slight difference in where the, that negative population is sitting on those um, scales. But crucially, uh, the signal looks the same and the, pop, the, the percentage of the populations is very similar, 4.7% uh, on the right-hand side for that highlighted population in the circle. And in the, the left-hand side, it's slightly higher at 5.3%, which you would expect to see slight differences when you're not working with the same um, initial nuclei prep, but you are working from the same um, starting piece of parent tissue that we then sub-dissected from. So to go back and answer my question, can we also save some money? Yes, we can. We've been able to reduce our antibody consumption by 50% while maintaining the same um, high quality signal that we see at the cytometer. So to, to sum up, really, by integrating the uh, laminar wash HG2000 into our uh, nuclei labeling protocol, we've been able to save time. We've been able to save money on uh, reagents. We've been able to have a greater flexibility where we're working with a limited sample input. So we, we, a limited number of nuclei that we get from each um, tissue dissection. And we've been able to do all of this without any uh, difference in the high quality of data that we've been able to put out. Um, so that's my presentation. I'd just like to say thank you for listening. And I'd like to thank um, Curiox Biosystems for giving me the platform to talk to you. Uh, it's been really great to work with them um, and give us a chance to enhance our nuclei preparation capabilities. There is a second section um, to this talk presented by Curiox Biosystems themselves. Uh, they do a lot of in-house work on cell and more recently nuclei biology, obviously taking uh, making full use of all the advantages that the laminar wash technology gives them. Um, I believe they're about to show us some of their data generated to address some of the newer demands uh, they've seen for nuclear retention, uh, especially from a, um, a biophysical and a, a true to biology perspective. So once again, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sashi. I'm a research scientist with Curiox, and today I'm here to talk about how laminar wash can help you retain the native subpopulation in your heterogeneous samples during sample prep. But before that, I'm going to talk about laminar wash. So how does laminar wash technology work? So basically, it is a centrifugeless washing system which uses our proprietary plate. The samples are plated on the 96 valve plate design without balls and the samples are settled at the bottom of the valve. The samples can be nuclei or cells. As you can see from the video, the debris or any unbound antibodies is then washed away by laminar flow, which is a turbulence-free washing technology. And by serial dilution, at the end of the wash, we are able to collect samples that are cleaner and stress-free. With his data um, at Cerements, where they actually worked with bulk isolated nuclei, they demonstrated with laminar wash uh, they attained the higher nuclear retention compared to centrifuge, which allows for smaller starting material. And this is particularly um, useful when they are working with rare tissue samples. And they also used laminar wash um, to attain similar or better staining of nuclei with 50% less antibodies. So this translates to savings on reagents and costs to about $3,600 per annum uh, when they're looking at five marker panel. Besides all these um, savings and retention, we were uh, at Curiox trying to identify other areas where laminar wash can help the research scientists. And we uh, decided on three particular areas. 
we wanted to see how laminar wash can maintain the ratios of subpopulations in a heterogeneous sample even after multiple washes. And we wanted to see the recovery rate after several washes. And we were wondering how efficient debris removal was going to be. And if you're wondering why this is even important, well, uh, with uh, single cell sequencing becoming more important and interesting right now, where scientists want to look at the whole tissue like brain or even blood samples, uh, these samples have different cell subsets. So um, being able to retain the natural, uh, the native subpopulation uh, frequency will allow scientists to identify any um, subtle difference in these populations um, which may arise due to disease or interventions. So how do we plan to check out these areas? We have a plan of action. We are going to mix nuclei isolated from differently sized cells to represent a heterogeneous population. And then we want to wash them to mimic downstream processing that goes on in labs. Then later we will determine the subpopulation integrity, debris removal and recovery. So here is my methodology for retention of heterogeneous nuclei samples. We use B16F10, which is a murine melanoma cell line. Uh, it, uh, it represents a medium-sized nuclei, size from 20 to 30 microns. And we use U937, a human monocytic cell line, to represent uh, the smaller range at 10 microns. So we perform nuclei isolation following the 10x genomics protocol. And unfixed nuclei was then spiked to provide a one is to one mixture. So the mixture was then washed uh, with centrifuge or laminar wash. And on centrifuge, we did a 30 minute washing. So the sample was then acquired on Celesta uh, together with counting bits. So we identify the sizing gate using the individual samples. And then we did the singlet gating for each subpopulation. And then we looked at the DAPI positive nuclei samples. So here I'm presenting my three conditions, laminar wash, centrifuge, and unwashed. So if you were to look at B16F10 subpopulation, it ranged at 28 to 29% frequency. But for U937, you will see it changed, uh, changed from 36% to 43% for centrifuge. And this data was further reconfirmed by looking at the absolute um, count of nuclei. So the ratio of U937 uh, to B16F10 was actually 1.2 for laminar wash, which was very close to unwashed at 1.1. For centrifuge, it was around 1.4. So the retention of U937 is actually uh, not significantly, significantly different across the conditions. But when we look at B16F10 nuclei, the retention was much lower for centrifuge. And this is how we were able to show that laminar wash allows better analysis of samples by retaining the rest of populations. Next, we looked at debris removal in tumor samples, uh, which are much dirtier than the cell lines. So we had a xenograph model and the single tumor cells were collected by mechanical disruption. Then we performed nuclei isolation following the 10x genomics protocol. We did the washing by centrifuge and laminar wash. Then the samples were acquired by uh, flow sedimentary on Celesta. And when we looked at the samples, we could see the non duppy events, which are considered our debris. It was much lower for uh, laminar wash when compared to centrifuge. In fact, centrifuge seems to introduce debris when compared to unwash. Basically, laminar wash provides us cleaner samples for downstream analysis. So here we identified the problems and I can show you that laminar wash gives you benefits. It allows you to retain the frequency of the subpopulations in samples. So allowing a better representation of samples uh, for sequencing and even flow analysis. And also laminar wash has better recovery rate. It requires less starting material. So if you're working with precious samples, laminar wash is a better bet. And laminar wash has better de debris removal. So you have cleaner sample for downstream analysis. Basically, um, laminar wash allows you to have better retention of rare heterogeneous samples during sample preparation. So if you are curious about Curiox yet, uh, check out our website for uh, further applications. And if you want, you can check out the video for the laminar wash uh, methodology. And please uh, drop a demo request form if you would like to work with us. And um, we look forward to helping you with your centrifugeless washing experience. Thank you for your time. And now we will move on to questions.
Thank you, David and Sashi, for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have any questions you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. David, I'm going to start with you. When working with nuclei and prepping for sorting, what are the major concerns that you had? For example, cell state. So we have two main concerns, really, and, and kind of the first one and the one that is always at the front of our minds when we're, we're handling uh, our samples from the from the frozen tissue onwards is we want to keep RNA degradation to to a minimum because our you know our platform is based on the quality of the RNA sequencing data that we get out at the end so we want to make sure that that RNA is in the best possible condition throughout the process so that when we get the cell type specific uh, nuclei populations out from the sorter that we've we've given ourselves the best shot at generating good quality RNA seq data. But also on the other hand, we kind of do want to make sure that like it's not an unmanageable protocol in terms of the the time span. So you will see other examples in the literature of um, antibody incubations taking place at four degrees uh, Celsius overnight. But then because it, we do a lot of indirect labeling, that would mean that's a, a two plus day protocol. Whereas shorter room temperature incubations, we're still able to get good quality uh, RNA seq data out, while meaning that we can conduct our entire nuclear isolation labeling protocol in a single day, ready for sorting on the next day. Our second um, concern has been just about maintaining a, a consistency in terms of the uh, quality of antibody labeling that we see between uh, nuclei preps. Um, and just making sure that again, what we see, step, what the signal we see on what, uh, from a panel in in one donor is is translatable across uh, multiple uh, donor tissues. Thanks, David. Sashi, let's come over to you. And we have some great questions coming in. Uh, let's start with this one. Besides imaging of nuclei, do you have other experiments to show nuclei integrity? Um, so yes, uh, for nuclei integrity, there are actually different ways to determine it, but for the purpose of this experiment, we only perform microscopic imaging. Uh, but we know customers like to look sample the supernatant for free RNA and uh, free nucleic axis uh, look, by looking at a drop or even um, use the cubic fluorometer. Very good. Let's stick with you. And um, how about this one? Do you have any insights into isolated nuclei preps from other methods, for example, FFPE types? Yeah, so personally, we have tried using fresh cells and frozen PBMCs, but with the um, FFPE types, right, um, I don't think it'll be much different once we have these single cells out. We can do the nuclear isolation in a similar manner and then continue with the washing. It wouldn't have any other effects. Thanks, Sashi. David, let's jump back to you. Besides improving the sample preparation steps through laminar wash, what else did you try previously? So we're kind of in a, you know, always uh, continually looking to, to try and refine and improve our protocols and especially look to try and maximize both our, our time uh, efficiency, but also our, our uh, nuclear retention efficiency. So alongside um, looking at, at Curiox and their laminar wash uh, technology, we've made small tweaks in kind of timings of how and when um, we transfer nuclei between different tube types during the earlier stages in the, the uh, isolation protocol um, and then we've you know we keep an eye on, on other new technology too so we've we've um, for example we've demoed automated cell counters to try and see if we can save time there um, however of the various examples we've tried they're either not set up to effectively count nuclei they're more kind of cell counters that we've tried to see if we can we can adapt and adjust 
um, or they they do work and they do count the nuclei well, but the you know the 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 price of the instrument is is too much for us to to justify in terms of the the relatively small amount of time we would save by by introducing that into our protocol. Thanks, David. I'm going to have another one for you here. What are your experiences with the retention rate of nuclei with laminar wash? For example, how do you measure that? So that was kind of that was the reason we first looked at um, Curiox's product in the first place was looking to to improve our, our nuclei retention, um, especially when working with smaller uh, nuclei input. So that was a lot of our very, very early demo work was looking at comparing um, low nuclei input amounts between laminar wash and centrifuge wash based um, labeling protocols. So we, we tried sort of a range from sort of as low as uh, 50,000 nuclei up to about 500,000 nuclei um, and just performed, uh, in this case, sort of direct antibody labeling with, with conjugated antibodies uh, and washed them with our two, uh, two different methods and then just recorded um, everything in the sample on the cytometers to see how much sample was left at the end of the labeling protocol. And actually, the, it was quite a stark difference. So when uh, comparing the centrifuge wash uh, sample to the laminar washed samples, um, the average fold change was a little over 1.5, so quite a big leap up in terms of retention. And we were also able to see that there was a, a smaller increase, but still a significant increase in that we saw a 7% increase in the um, percentage of single nuclei um, in comparison to the, the centrifuge wash. So again, we saw a, a slight reduction in both the, the uh, droplets on the cytometer containing aggregated nuclei or um, droplets containing debris. So both, you know, both from a, a, a sample retention and a, a sample quality point of view on the, the cytometer, we were seeing improvements um, with the laminar wash. That's great, great David. Thank you for that. Sashi, question over for you. An unbiased wash is important. What other parameters can we optimize on the laminar wash platform? Yeah, so we can always optimize the incubation time, the incubation volume. We can also optimize on the washing flow rate to make sure we have an efficient wash while retaining the uh, nuclei at the best possible optimal amount. Thanks, Sashi. Um, we have time for just a few more. I'm gonna go one more with you and we'll close with David. Have you looked into free DNA RNA removal? Yes, we have. In fact, we recently had a, a demo with our client. They were using oligoprops and after washing, they looked at the supernatin. Um, they used the um, curobid fluorometer to identify any free nucleic acid. So it was really um, a new way uh, instead of just looking at our, you know, flow cytometry or any other way. They were using this fluorometer to quickly, um, without any gel analysis or anything, they were quickly just using the fluorometer. Thank you, Sashi. And David, this question came in a few times, so I do want to end with this one so I can answer multiple attendees. How many antibody savings were you able to save? For example, cost per assay or cost per well? Well, I, I kind of, I did, I addressed it a bit in the slides. Um, so we were able to, to overall make a, a, a general reduction for all our primary and secondary antibodies. Um, or we were able to, to reduce the amount we would add to each reaction by 50%. Um, and I kind of, I pulled out some of those numbers there. Um, so for a, a, quite an extreme example, that antibody B I was talking about, um, I, I sort of estimate that over the course of a year at our current usage, we spend about uh, a little over three and a half thousand pounds just on that one antibody. So I think that the number is closer to three thousand six hundred pounds. Um, so in just that one example, by using half the amount of it, we, we were able to, to effectively um, halve our, our, our costs there. So we we're able to save um, nearly two thousand pounds, so one thousand eight hundred pounds. Uh, just in that one example. Another less extreme example there was, was antibody C, but again, over the course of a year, we'd save uh, slightly over £500 on, on that one example. 
So overall, it adds up to, to thousands and thousands of pounds um, across all our, our different panels. Sure. Thank you, David. And Sasha, David, thank you both for joining us today. I'd like to give you the opportunity to give any final comments to our audience. Uh, I think for me, it's just, a, a, you know, again, I said it at the end of my slides, but, but thank you for listening. And, and then again, I'll repeat my, my thank you to, to Curiox as well for, for giving us the opportunity to, to present some of the work that, that our group have, have done um, with them to, to enhance our, our, our throughput and our, our, our um, capabilities. So, yeah, uh, just thank you. Yes, and I would also like to thank David, uh, for giving us this beautiful presentation, sharing all this uh, great data. And again, um, we just want to reiterate the savings and benefits with Lemina Wash. Um, it is also very good for your cells or sneak lie work that you're doing. They are uh, maintained stress free. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you again, David and Sashi, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Curiox, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, before we go, I would like to thank the audience for joining us and for their interesting questions. There were quite a few questions we were unable to get to, so those questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period, they will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Today's webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.